reform that began in January of this year. It goes on with the district attorney's reluctance to prosecute quality of life crimes and some city council members who don't want us to deal with quality of life at all. And in March and April, we saw prisoners, many who were convicted criminals and parolees, released from Rikers due to COVID, lowering the Rikers population to half of what it was at this point last year. On top of all this, the courts have been shut down, and many individuals who were indicted by a grand jury on gun charges are not in jail, but instead are free, awaiting for the courts to open up. And hundreds more criminals who have been arrested for possession of a gun have not yet been indicted by a grand jury because the courts are not in session. They, too, are not behind bars. If these tremendous challenges were not enough, New York City had days and days of anti-police marches that honestly crushed the morale of our cops, and it created a large sense of animosity towards the police. And I'm not speaking about the peaceful protests that took place. This anti-police rhetoric led Commissioner Shea to make a difficult decision to disband our anti-crime teams with our officers' well-being in mind. These were the men and women who went into harm's way daily to take guns off our streets. It seems that the people who demoralized our men and women in blue on so-called protest lines and some of our elected officials have short-term memories. I want to remind everyone that these are the same great cops who everyone was applauding during the height of COVID. The same cops who fully embraced neighborhood policing to become even closer to every New Yorker. The same cops who drove down crime and violence to historic lows while reducing arrests. And the same courageous cops like officers Estevez and Lopez from the 4-0 precinct who had a bullet go through their windshield while they were in their police car late Saturday night in the Bronx. Now, as officers try to fight crime, they must take pause before making an arrest due to the insanity of the diaphragm bill passed by the city council. As it criminalizes cops who put their knee on someone's back while they are struggling for their life with an individual who is violent and resisting arrest. As the NYPD faces these challenges, we will continue to work with every community member across this city and not just the loudest voices at protests. As far as the statistics and numbers behind it all, I'll turn it over to Chief Mike LePetri. Mike. Good afternoon. Going to get into the violence for June. So June, uh, we saw uh, 39 murder victims with zero reclassifications. Out of the 39 murder victims, 28 were gunshot victims. That's 72% of our murder victims. That's usually around 55%. When we look at the, the method, 28 were shot, seven were cut, four, four were forced. Outside murders, 33 out of 39, or 85% were outside. Let's take a look at last year, 13 or 45%. Let's look at our gang motives. 28% of our murders in June were gang motivated. Let's look at last year, 3%. 51% of our murders in June had a gang nexus. 2019, 17%. When we look at the victims, all murder victims in June were of the minority community. Let's look at the parole population. 19% of our murders in June, a parolee was involved. Last year, 3%. When we look at the uh, male-female breakdown, 35 were male, four were female. Let's take you to the beginning of July these numbers that I'm giving you, we have to go back to 1996 and 1995 to get higher numbers. 
I'll take you back to 1996. Over 2,500 shooting incidents, almost 3,000 shooting victims, and almost 1,000 murders. These numbers that we're talking about today are not numbers. Guess what? They're victims. Let's see what 2019 ended up. 319 murder victims, still way too high. 777 shooting incidents, way too high. 923 victims. But we come a long way from 1996. Let's look at July's murders. 14 out of 16 or 88% have been victims of gunshot. I've been looking at this for a long time. When I, when I look at what it usually is, I said it, it's about 55%. 69% were outside so far in July, and also all the murder victims in July have been of the minority community. Let's talk about shootings. 205 shooting incidences in June with 270 victims. That's, in, that's an increase of 164 shooting victims. When we look at street shootings, 72% of our shootings happened on a New York City, city street. When I look back to 2019, the percentage of shooting incidents on the street 58%. Over 50% of our shootings have a crew nexus. When I look at the victims, 97% of our shooting victims in June were of the minority community. And in July, all our shooting victims have been of the minority community. Again, when we look at our parolee population, and I know we're going to get into Rikers releases, and I'll speak about Rikers releases, and I'll also, sp I'll also speak about the 2,500 individuals that were released early because of COVID. And I just want to remind everybody, 75% of those releases were convicted felons. And the NYPD did have a voice, and our voice was ignored. We recommended 96% of that population not to be released. It was ignored. And now we have more victims, and we see the lawlessness on the streets. When we look at where the shootings are happening, half, almost half, of the shootings in June are in 10 precincts. 10. Almost half. There's 77 precincts in New York City, ladies and gentlemen. And almost half of the shootings happened in 10 precincts. And if you want to stretch it to 15, then we're going over 60%. Those communities are being overrun by the small percentage of gang members who have no regard for their own life and absolutely zero regard for the community. I'd just like to touch on, on uh, commercial burglaries, burglaries, grand larcenies of an auto. Uh, just, you know, in, in June, we, we continue to struggle with, with burglary and grand larceny of an auto. Um, it's, it's very simply tied to, to the following factors. And I'd love to share the data that I have, the empirical data and the anecdotal evidence that I have, that my office has, that my data scientists work at, that the men and women continue to, to, to get the data behind it. I'm not sitting up here not giving you data. Burglaries, robberies prior to the pandemic were clearly driven by bail reform laws. When you look at it as a whole, up till last week, we saw the same population of non-bail eligible felony arrests re-arrested for 750 more seven majors. Now I'm sure somebody in this room is going to say that's only 700. Well, tell one of those victims. Go ahead, tell them. So 750 more seven major victims 
were arrested, ladies and gentlemen. These are not suspects. These are not what we think they did. These are arrested, and guess what? We're an agency of 40,000 less arrests. Can you imagine if we were arresting at the same level we were last year? That's 750, it's gonna be a lot higher. And when we look at the non-bail eligible burglary and robbery arrest, that is the population, the recidivists, that continue to prey on New Yorkers. So let's just take a look at that population. When I look at non-bail eligible burglary and robbery offenses, which is your residential home, now changed, thank God, your robbery, try to walk to the store, try to walk from work, get robbed by an individual, get robbed by a group, still not bail eligible break into somebody's mom and pop store, guess what, still not bail eligible. Those are the crimes absolutely being driven by bail reform. So let's just key on, on those two. Burglary and robbery rearrests, they have been rearrested more than 1,000 times. So just taking that population of a burglary non-bail eligible felony and a robbery non-bail eligible felony, obviously they're all felonies, we see them committing 500 more seven majors rearrested. I'm sorry, rearrested for 500 more seven majors and rearrested a thousand more times for an agency that is down 40,000 arrests. So I hear that th there's no data behind this. 11th floor, Chief of Crime Control Strategies. We'll share the data, and I'm sharing the data with you now. Chief Monahan talked about the closing of the courts in and around March 16th. My office has been tracking post-pandemic crime since, since March 12th. And I'm gonna give you some statistics. We have 3,000 people, 3,000 individual unique people that have been arrested approximately 9,000 times since the pandemic. That's not recidivism. <clears throat> we talk about Rikers releases. We talk about bail reform. How about we talk about who's not going into Rikers? Nobody. RRs, F, released on your own recognizant, released on your own recognizant, released on your own recognizant, and then commit a murder. That's a true story. That's a data-driven story right there. And then we talk about gun arrests. And Chief Monahan touched on it, all oh, the disbanding of the anti-crime. How about the open 2,000 gun arrests that New York City has since 2019? 2,000. How about the open 1,000 gun indictments? I, put, I brought you back to the, to, to, the, to the really, really bad days of, of New York City. Well, I'm gonna bring you back only six years from now talking about gun arrest data. 40%, 40% of our gun arrests in 2013 and 2014 ended up with some kind of jail or prison. 2019, disposed cases, 17%. So let me say that again, 17% of all the disposed cases carrying the legal gun in New York City, guess what, you need a gun to shoot somebody. We have seen a, a, a prison or jail sentence. So everybody wants the, the easy way as well, they disbanded the anti-crime. How about the 2,000 open gun indictments that, that, we're not, that we don't hear about? I have an individual that gets arrested in 2018 for an illegal firearm. It takes a year to indict that person because there's plea bargaining possibly going on. And guess what? That person does a triple shooting in Queens in June. And I have more than one story on each one of these. Rikers releases, I'll, I'll, I'll say it now, and I know I'm gonna get the question. 
So when we look at Riker's releases, 275 people that were released early, out of approximately 2,500 people, have been, have been arrested approximately 550 times. Again, I, I hope, which Hawking rearrests here after they got out. Not for a crime that happened in January. So again, I'll explain the data all day long. Not for a crime that happened in January. They get released on March 29th, and then we rearrest them in April for the crime in January. That's not how we built it. We built it to show what would happen and exactly what we knew would happen happens. And that's what happens when 75% of convicted felons in that list get released. And I will tell people there are sexual predators that were released early that committed crimes against children. Those are the individuals that got out. NYPD, 96% we said no. And w when we look at violence with the 275, we have two individuals that committed a murder after a release. One of the individuals might have already had finished his sentence at the time of the murder. One of the, the, the other individual absolutely we think would have still been in Rikers and committed a murder. And we tie approximately nine people to violent acts across the city, uh, in, in, you know, around a shooting or a, a murder. Just want to touch on going back to my bail reform, because again, when we talk about this, I know the violence is going to come up. So when we look at individuals, again, this is this is in, involved in a shooting or a murder. They could be a witness, they could be a POI, they could be a suspect, they could have been arrested, they could be a witness. So we see 56 people that are arrested for non-bail eligible felonies. And again, we're talking about a six month period here. Non-bail eligible felonies, ROR, 56 of those people have some kind of connection to a shooting. When we look at bail eligible, something I don't hear anybody talk about when we talk about bail eligible, it's still got to be the least restrictive manner. So when we look at bail eligible individuals who have to be, who have to get out on the le least restrictive manner, which usually means non-monetarily, which usually means could be go to work, can't travel, don't commit a crime things that we know don't work. 80 people, 80 individuals who have got, who got ROI for a bail eligible crime, remember least restrictive manner, have been in and around a, a shooting incident in New York City. I know Chief Monaghan touched on it, but there is a multitude of reasons why shootings have increased in New York City. When it comes to street violence, we see what the precursors are. We have the knowledge to stop shootings. It's unfortunate that most of our powers were taken away to stop the shooting. Used knowledge is power. Well, we have the knowledge. We don't have the power. All right, open it up for questions. Who 
are suspected of, who you have not arrested, that you also suspect of being involved in additional shootings. Uh, because I think that's where the focus is right now, shootings and murders, which are primarily shootings. So I, I would like to hear you provide that number, because so far it's clear. Let me start. All right, so you, you start off with 136 saying that's not much. Th those are the ones that we've identified at the scenes of a shooting. So 136 times as a perp, victim, suspect, or witness, that's a lot of times that they're out on the scene. People that wouldn't be out there, wouldn't have been victimized, wouldn't have shot somebody if they weren't out on the streets. So that is a big number out there. As you take it out, as we have an increase, you take 136 possibly out of there, that number drops. It drops substantially. And those are the ones that we've identified. So that is a major number. I don't want to make light of it. And another one that he didn't do is open gun arrest. There's an additional 40 people who are out on an open gun arrest that have been on the scene of a shooting. That's a lot of individuals who could be sitting in a jail cell right now instead of being out there around gunfire in our city. And again, this is not tied to one factor. Yeah. There are numerous factors. You, you this have is to put right. this all together. And if, you, if we continue to to be short-sighted and say, well, it's, it's one factor. It's not one factor. I think what I wanted to say is we don't hear you, we hear you giving a lot of numbers but not necessarily making a direct connection to the changes uh, to the criminal justice reform, which has mainly been the NYPD argument for almost a year that Good. criminal justice reform, raise the age, bail reform, parole and records releases are responsible for these dramatic rises in crime and particularly shootings. And I'm just not hearing provide data that supports the direct connection. Again, I don't expect you to have it all, obviously, but I do expect, you know, something a little bit, you know, given the the the, the impact that NYPD has said these events have had, I, I just expect the numbers to be a little bigger. Okay, so I'm gonna read you the data. All right, I'm gonna read data. So these are non bail eligible burglary and robbery rearrests. 563 of the 2,372 NYSEGs, or 23.7%, were rearrested at least once for an offense committed after their initial arrest. These 563 NYSEGs, which is unique people, were responsible for 1,501 rearrests, 2.7 rearrests per NYSEG. The table on the right relates to the 1,500 rearrests. 656 of the 1,501 rearrests for non bail eligible burglaries and robberies, or 44% were seven majors. Now I'll take you to 2019, comparing the same population of people. 278 of 1,395 NYSEGs, or 19.9%, .9 were rearrested for at least once for an offense committed after initial arrest. The 278 NYSEGs were responsible for 569 rearrests. The table on the right relates to the 569. 150, remember I said 600, I said 656 in 2020, 150 of the 569 rearrests or 26% were seven majors. It was at 44%. That is a direct correlation to recidivism that's driving the burglary and the robbery number. And when you look pre-pandemic, we were an agency that was up approximately 3,007 majors being driven by robbery, burglary, and grand larceny auto. And since I talked about grand larceny auto, I'll tie bail reform to that too. The New York City Police Department, with the change in the bail law, now gives a desk appearance ticket to somebody who steals possibly a $30,000 motor vehicle in New York City. We give a DAT. They walk out of the precinct station house and they jump into another car that's running to steal. So that doesn't affect not only the person who's the registered owner, but how about the family that needs that car to go to work? I have the data. I will share it to you. I will share with you the data that I have. But again, it is not one factor. There are so many factors that's going on. Here. 
Absolutely. There, there is a fear going through the police officers right now from the diaphragm law. And I call it the diaphragm law, not the chokehold law. We have no issue with the first portion of it. It's been banned for years, the idea of restricting someone's airway. Every cop knows that's not something that they should do. But the diaphragm is the idea if you kneel, sit, or stand on someone's back or chest during the course of an arrest, you can be arrested in New York City. And it only pertains to New York City police officers and peace officers. So if a state trooper does that in New York City, that's fine. But a New York City police officer arresting someone who is violently resisting, who is fighting them, which we're seeing all the time right now, can be arrested for that, which is absolute lunacy. I've spoken to all five DAs about it. They believe that it's an ill-conceived bill, but they haven't come out publicly to say it. One of them even said they thought the bill was unconstitutional. Spoke to a lot of city council members about this bill prior to them signing it. They all thought that that portion of the bill was not appropriate, should not have been put in there, but not one of them wanted to be the council member that was seen as watering down a police reform bill. So we as a city are now faced with a bill that Rory Lansman proposed. Rory Lansman, who is in one of the safest and affluent neighborhoods in the city, has signed a bill that is going to affect people in economically deprived areas of the city and have violence because police officers may be hesitant to step forward and, and grab someone for a quality of life offense if during the course of that the person resists and their knee should accidentally end up on that person's back. This is a tough summer. We have to look at it. We're looking at ways that we can get more guns off the street. It is quite obvious a lot of people are walking around with guns. So we've been sitting down, myself, Mike, uh, the commissioner, Rodney Harrison, Fausto, trying to come up with a system. How do we get our cops to engage people with guns? And we will, because that's going to be important. We need to get our communities involved. Every community has to step up. We have reached out to them through neighborhood policing. We have relationships on the ground. We need those communities to step up and tell us how they want their neighborhoods policed. Is it okay to have people drinking on your street, smoking marijuana on your street? Or do you need quality of life enforcement out there? What does the community want? Uh, I think Governor Cuomo says that quite often. What does the community want? The police need to police the way the community wants? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to reach out to every neighborhood in the city Ask them what they want, and not listen to just the loud voices, but to everyone out there. Come and tell us what you need done in your neighborhoods. We can fix it. We can fix this city. We can get it back. We did it. We, wrote, we drove crime down to historic low levels, but we need cooperation with the people who are sitting afraid to come out of their buildings right now. We need everyone to come forward and work together so we can get this city back. For this weekend, I don't have that data yet. We're still early on in most of the investigations. Obviously, a very busy weekend. Our detectives have been working like crazy trying to solve it. We've made some arrests on some high-profile cases uh, also uh, recently. So as that data comes in, we'll know. It takes some time to get these arrests. Steve Burr. Now, the cops are out there every day. They're out there, and if they see a guy with a gun, if they see someone doing a robbery, they're going to do what they do every day, run into harm's way, and, and make that arrest. Are they going to be as proactive to quality of life offenses? Well, if a community tells us they don't want us to do it, then we have to think twice. But uh, our cops will do what the neighborhoods want, what we need to do to keep the city safe. As far as investigations, we have the greatest detectives in the world. And that's how we're going to solve it, build strong cases to make sure that when we do lock these individuals up, that they stay in jail. Chair, can you give us uh, an update on this weekend regarding the tally of 37 shootings, 55 victims, and 10 fatalities? I'd, if we start from Friday at 001, that'd be Thursday night into Friday morning, all the way through midnight on Sunday, 
It is 45 shootings, 64 victims, 11 murders. So when I look at those 10 neighborhoods, six out of 10 are in Brooklyn. Three are in the Bronx. And one is in Northern Manhattan. And when I look at what's plaguing those neighborhoods right now, again, we're, we're seeing street related violence driven by crew members. We are absolutely seeing an uptick in large gatherings that then become violent. We've also seen an increase, and it's something that we haven't seen in a long time, in drive-by shootings in those same neighborhoods. So again, Chief Monahan spoke about it, about the, the diaphragm law. 10, 10 precincts, 10 out of 77 almost half the shootings in June were in those precincts. Julia Palmer? So what are, what are you not hearing from the community that's here that you need leadership and what do you want to hear from them to address the shootings or communities or to the city at large? I want them to stand up. First off, you know, the cops in the city have done one hell of a job protecting it. I would like to hear some city officials acknowledge the work that's been done by the members of this department how they transformed the city after 2014 with neighborhood policing. What other city in the country was able to reduce crime, reduce violence, while reducing arrests, reducing stops, reducing summonses? And not only reduce it by a little, but reduce it by a lot. Able to establish ties within the community. All of this got forgotten once George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota. I need them to acknowledge the work that was done, where we were going as a police agency prior to that, and stand together with us because it can't be how bad the police are and, and us over here. We need to work together because we don't move the city without us, the police department, the electeds, and the communities that are behind those doors right now standing together to move forward. So that's what we need. We knew, block, well, you, you knew bail reform and we've been working on it and changes were made effective this week that'll help somewhat. The violence came after the George Floyd incident. Listen, we've been tied up with cops out on demonstrations every single day. And I'm talking thousands of cops that are out there watching protests throughout the city instead of being in their neighborhoods, policing those streets each and every day because we need to monitor these protests make sure that there's no uptick in violence. This all progressed from May 29th, where we were May 29th, up a little bit in shootings for the year, something we were able to address like we always would address. The explosions happened after that. The explosions started after the murder of George Floyd, after the protests here in the city, after the animosity towards the police within this city, after a feeling of emboldenment by the criminals on the streets that the cops can't do anything anymore that no one likes the police, that they can get away with things, and that it's safe to carry a gun out on the street. We have to get that back. This has been a month's time, just over a month, that this has taken off. Together, us and the members of our community can get it back, but it's going to take teamwork to do it. Not propaganda. Take a look at what's going on out in the streets right now. Don't call it propaganda in Harlem when so many people were shot, in Brownsville when so many people were shot. Murders up in the 4-4 precinct over this weekend. That's not propaganda. 
That's violence. Mike, you want to talk about this, this? This is some anecdotal evidence. This hits all factors. Like I said, I'm not going to just tie a violence increase into one factor. It's many factors. We have an individual that gets arrested on March 13. I'm sorry. We have an individual that gets arrested on May 25th for criminal sale of controlled substance. Not a bail eligible charge anymore. You have to be a major trafficker. Still looking to define that totally. You have to be a major trafficker to get a bail in New York City for a narcotics related offense. When, by the way, narcotics related shootings are up. ROI for that. And on June 6th, that person committed a stabbing murder. We have an individual arrested, parolee. Remember I said we're at the highest, we, highest rates we've ever seen since we started tracking it in 2005 for parolee-involved incidents and murders and shootings. This person is a parolee. He gets arrested for committing two domestic violence offenses on March 29th. Gets ROI for each one of those. He then commits another domestic violence offense on April 24th, gets ROI for that, and then he shoots and kills an individual in June. So there's multiple stories behind that one. Was that a, a double murder? No. Okay. The, the three domestic violence uh, obviously were. Right? The shooting, no. That was another crew motivated shooting in the areas that I spoke about. We have an individual, we have an individual gets arrested, is being held, gets an early COVID release, and commits a murder. We then have an individual that assaults the same person that he ends up murdering four days later. So he assaults an acquaintance, gets ROR'd, and then on March 10th, four days later, he kills that person. So go back to my original statement. Nobody's going into Rikers, everybody's getting out of Rikers. Those are the examples that we're seeing, and we have many more. Fourteen out of sixteen were gun, were gun. I, I think ten. they were. Ten, ten out of a uh, ten, ten out of eleven. One ten stab. One stab in domestic. And, and what's what's your prognosis for the rest of this summer in terms of predicting what crime in the city will look like over the next few months? It could be problematic. We need to turn this around. We need to get the people in every community out with their cops saying, let's put an end to this right now. We need some help, and I'm going to keep saying this, this diaphragm law. We need that to be changed to give our cops the confidence that they need that if they fight with somebody, that they're not going to go to jail if their knee hits their back. Unintentionally. Unintentionally. We need to be able to work together and identify some of these individuals, and we have a lot identified from these shootings, and be able to put them in jail. Uh, I know Commissioner Shea sat down with the five DAs and Janet D. Fioria today, talking about the opening of courts. They're saying the earliest that you're going to get a grand jury open is going to be August 10th, which means there are cases that we have where we have identified shooters that just need to be presented to a grand jury that are going to have to wait. So it allows those individuals to stay out there even longer. So it, it could be a problem, but we will make adjustments as necessary and keep this city as safe as we can working together with our communities.
uh, 2020's got a lot different than 2019. We take in the George Floyd protest on top of the pandemic. I mean, I, I, Commissioner Shea keeps saying the perfect storm, and that's exactly what this was. COVID plays a huge portion of it. That's why the courts are closed. Four months of no courts open because you can't gather people together to process cases so we can move cases along, so we can have grand juries. People have nowhere to go, so they're out on their same street corner. They're not going to bars, they're not going to restaurants, they're not going to clubs. Where are they going to go? It's 95 degrees out. They're going to come outside their house and hang out on their block in the thousands at times, and that's what we saw this weekend. So, yeah, COVID is playing another role. It's part of everything that is rolling together that's making this a historically tough year for the NYPD. Dungeon Priestle, he was, uh, he was arrested by uh, the district attorney's office, Queen's district attorney's office. So now we, we sit back and they are prosecuting at this point while we continue a side investigation where we can't interact with what's going on in a criminal investigation. So Chief, uh, Chief Commissioner Resnick is still working on that case. So th the first part of your question, I'll say this. This year, 40% of all gun arrests have been released on their own recognizance compared to 25% last year, okay? We have seen some preliminary hearings uh, take place for gun arrests. Some district attorneys are, are doing them more than others, but the, the short answer is yes, there have been some preliminary hearings. So the, the increase in the percentage, do you think, uh, do we have some proof that there's been some increase? Yes, we absolutely see more released on their own recognizance because of the pandemic. We're also seeing a reluctance in some cases to do the preliminary hearing where the district attorney would like to do a grand jury uh, indictment instead of the preliminary hearing. All right, I'd just like to have uh, Chief Wilcox just go into a quick update, uh, the great work that our detectives do on the Brandon Hendricks homicide in the 4-6. Thank you, Chief. I just, uh, <clears throat> over the weekend, obviously we're talking about the violence. I just want to remind the room that at every one of those acts of violence, all those shootings, those murders, there were detectives at the scene uh, investigating, gathering witnesses, gathering video, doing the great work that they do, um, the excellence that they always display. Um, we, we've been affected, as all of us have been, by the challenges of this year, but the uh, Detective Bureau has not uh, diminished in our drive uh, to remove killers off the street. So I want to take you back uh, a little bit to uh, June 28th, a very tragic murder in the Bronx in the confines of the 46th Precinct. A young man, 17 years old, Brandon Hendricks, uh, killed having just graduated high school on the threshold of going to what everyone seemed to agree was a, 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 an amazing future, uh, killed uh, with gun violence. So I can, the detectives at the 46th Precinct have been working that case uh, relentlessly. Um, that hard work identified a suspect and the Fugitive Enforcement Unit, particularly our uh, Bronx Violent Felony Squad, have been uh, working hard to uh, apprehend that suspect and they did so this morning. So this morning the Bronx Violent Felony Squad apprehended uh, a 22-year-old male, Najim Luke, a Bronx resident a robbery history. Uh, he was apprehended, brought back to the 46th Precinct, and he has been arrested for murder. 
in that case. Um, there's a few other cases I want to uh, talk about really quickly. So part of the violence from yesterday, uh, the 44th Precinct was uh, impacted very hardly yesterday. Uh, it's a precinct I know very well. Uh, I was a cop there. So yesterday afternoon, a very, very cruel uh, crime, a murder um, of Mr. Anthony Robinson, a 29-year-old male walking along 170th Street. R remind you, late afternoon, broad daylight, walking with his six-year-old daughter, walking westbound towards the Grand Concourse when a car pulls up next to them. A male in that car rolls down the window and reaches a gun out and shoots him, killing him in front of that child at the intersection. Um, a cruel uh, and senseless murder. Uh, obviously, Mr. Robinson isn't the only victim of that crime. That young girl is a victim of that crime. That community in that northeast part of the 4-4 precinct is also a victim of this murder. So earlier this morning, I'm going to hold up a poster. The chief of detectives, Rodney Harrison, has issued a $10,000 reward for any information regarding this uh, homicide of Mr. Robinson. So one of the cases I want to bring to your attention, um, another vicious uh, murder. And I'm going to take you over to Brooklyn now. Again, broad daylight, two people sitting in front of their building along Van Sicklin Avenue when they are gunned down by a male, a violent male with a violent history, uh, armed with an assault rifle who guns them down in cold blood, killing them. And we have video of him running away from the scene with that assault rifle. So Mr. Charles Hernandez is our suspect, 47-year-old male, on parole for weapons possession. This is his picture. We have a Crime Stoppers reward for him. It's also on the screen behind me. A violent individual. Our detectives from the Fugitive Enforcement Division are actively hunting him. But again, we reach out to the community and we seek out their assistance and their support for any information that they can provide to help us bring this suspect to uh, justice. Thank you. Anything just on, on these shootings? Michael? So obviously the the Hendricks case is still very much evolving. I don't want to go into motive right now. Um, you know, he's being arrested and charged today. That will come out um, as it goes along. But again, um, a senseless act at a barbecue. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, uh, a young uh, man, comes to really to seek to see uh, friends at a barbecue on Davidson Avenue and is killed for that. Um, again, the motive regarding the double murder in the 7-5, I don't want to go, I'm not going to go into that right now. That's part of the investigation. It's an active, very much an active investigation, and um, we'll get into that. I know you mentioned, uh, Rocco, let's, again, let's go back to the Bronx and another census murder. Uh, right, you mentioned Tiana Johnson, a young woman. Uh, again, another another example of a young person on the threshold of uh, of unlimited potential uh, killed uh, by census gun violence. So, the detectives of the 47th precinct, um, working with Bronx Homicide Squad and many other facets of the detective bureau, have been working non-stop on this case, and um, that's where it's where we are now. Again. As you can see up there, there's a $10,000 Crime Stoppers reward. Uh, we're seeking out any information and support from the community that will help us solve this uh, census crime. Uh, uh, okay. Last question, Juliet. Can you say at all on the murder of the victim and the accused uh, suicide? 
I can't say that right now. You take a look at what's happened this weekend, the amount of shootings uh, just the last week, 74 incidents, 101 victims, 101 people who took a bullet, 18 who were killed. Imagine if there weren't cops out there. Imagine if it wasn't detectives responding to every scene, if it wasn't detectives identifying the murderers that are out there that are perpetrating this violence. Just imagine how bad it would be if you ever abolished the police. Let's not listen to the voices if you walk across the street at City Hall Park over there and take a look on the street, you see the communist hammer and sickle that they painted out on the street. Are these the voices? Are these the loud voices that we should be following, that this city should be following? I hope not. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you.